So let me introduce my educators today. We have uh, Desiree Venicia, who for me is right here. <laughs> um, Desiree teaches middle school, primarily, primarily eighth grade, right? Seventh and eighth graders. Seventh and eighth grade at uh, JL Long, um, so DISD. Jesse teaches at Woodrow Wilson High School, and Brantley uh, teaches at Dallas, Dallas College. So for those of you who don't know, all of the Dallas Community Colleges have actually joined forces for one Dallas College entity. Um, so what would be what, what, what were the schools? I mean, they still have their names, but um, Brantley, is it East Brookhaven? Oh, I, I was at Brookhaven, yeah. Okay, Brookhaven, cool. All right, so, great. Um, and uh, this is, uh, should be a pretty relaxed format. We're just gonna kind of discuss um, what is going on in these classrooms. Um, my background as an educator is um, primarily uh, high school and higher ed and then also museum education, although I am out of academics and in nonprofit right now. So I am missing a lot of information about what is going on in classrooms today. Um, so we are gonna spend a little bit of time sort of talking about what that looks like because I know uh, a lot of schools are using different modalities and teachers are in the position of figuring things out at a rapid pace. Luckily, this is something that you guys aren't um, unfamiliar with. I think that that is characteristic of teaching altogether, but um, I applaud anyone who is uh, going through this endeavor and students too. I know that there's a lot of challenges and today we're gonna to focus on solutions. So um, let's start just having each of you kind of give a quick uh, description of how your school is man managing art education right now. Uh, Desiree. Very broad statement. Um, I guess in a sense my school is handling art education by um, me handling it. So it's more or less like, I mean, to be honest, like if I feel as though that something needs to happen for my program, then my principal is just allowing me to do that. So I'm able to conduct the classes. So I guess in more sense, like she's trusting me to move my program forward. Um, the biggest thing that we're handling right now is being equitable for our students. So um, we're, we've been focusing on making sure every kid gets supplies for right now. And then we're moving into the actual lesson part of it. So once, that's been our main focus right now. It's just making sure every kid gets the art supplies that they need in order to continue doing art um, outside of the classroom if they're not coming back. Okay, so, so you are teaching generally in your classroom, but to students who are tuning in virtually, correct? So I'm teaching, um, so for the past couple of weeks, I've been teaching to all my kids virtually um, from my classroom. And then on Monday, uh, we move into the next phase, which is like basically if, you, if the parent chose or the child chose to come back to school, all of our seventh and eighth graders are gonna be returning back to the school who chose to come to school. So- This, this Monday. Yeah, ne yeah. So we've been focusing, me and my co-teacher have been focusing on just making sure that every student has supplies um, so that means even if you are returning back, you still get the same supplies that the person that's at home gets. So making sure it's even across the board. So that's been our main focus for this week. Great. Okay, what about you, Jesse? What's going on at Woodrow? Yeah, so right now at Woodrow, we are getting ready to go to hybrid, just like Desiree is. Um, so students will have the option to come in person if they want to. Freshmen are at, on campus this week, so I've had both. Um, for me in general, though, I do a lot of pre-recorded sessions as well as live Zoom. So if kids want to come in and tune in, they can tune into live Zoom or they can watch a pre-recorded lesson. I really like having both options um, and I alternate. So um, that way it kind of alleviates stress on me as a teacher because um, to be in so many Zooms and then also do, I'll just say like classroom management for the digital class. Um, there's a lot of just 
busy work that needs to happen. And so I've kind of tried alleviating some of that by having pre-recorded lessons. Um, and then of course, I mean, I think with any art class, you do have to give students an idea like, um, like time and space to work on their own. So I'm thinking of even just having Zoom at the end of some classes and making it optional. So if you need to come in at the end of the assigned hour, then maybe come in at the end of the hour. Tell me how you're doing. If you have questions on the video, check in, show me what you're working on. Cool. And then we have art bags also. So I don't know if that, I mean, for us, we have kits that students receive. Um, I made sure like all my high level classes, those are all my priority. And then we're trying to figure out how to get things to the masses, the low level beginner stu students. Okay. So has um, sort of like equity within the classroom and making sure that everybody has equal ground been something that's been difficult to achieve for you as well? So one of the things that has, I think helps with making things equitable as far as materials and supplies. We use a lot of digital drawing apps, which um, I also enjoy demoing for students. And they, um, they're already, so many students are already into um, digital video games or like Pixar films. And so for them beginning to see that, like they can use those um, like apps that are free, they get really excited and really invested. So I've had a high amount of digital students. Um, and that helps because most of them have phones so they can use um, Adobe Sketch, which is pretty cool. If you've never played with it, it is a really fun, really easy uh, drawing app on your phone. And the students that maybe don't have phones, were they all given um, devices? They were given computers. Okay. Yeah. So can you use the, use you, it the same you know, way? Uh, um, Google has some drawing tools but, and I have had a couple students play around with them, um, but students, most students have access to paper um, and pencil, um, which is just primarily what we're working with. Start of the school year, talking about line and gesture and contour lines and really, uh, you know, just you, doable from home type stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what about you, Brantley? I know, so like these are both DISD teachers um and you've got a, a pretty different situation over at dallas college what's going on so the way that we've kind of got it set up right now is that um, we can either go to synchronous function or asynchronous function and for my art appreciation courses i've chosen to go with asynchronous function meaning that we don't actually have a set me time ever that i just kind of post the assignments or I'll post the lectures and PowerPoints or, and essentially my teaching notes that I would be lecturing about directly to the students. So they have not only the artworks to reference, the actual textbook information to reference, but then my notes to reference too. And then when I was teaching uh, drawing, uh, we would have, uh, this, again, the asynchronous function, but they would have individual meet times to where we would do a uh, essentially blackboards version of Zoom's meeting and we would have portfolio reviews or individual critiques. And um, as far as kind of how getting supplies and things to students, we have at Dallas College, they have the, uh, um, I guess like a bundle or whatever of supplies that each teacher like filled out a supply list and then they, the, 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 uh, college got all of the supplies together and mailed them out to students that was took a little while to get students to get their supplies and stuff of course and there are still some students that haven't actually received anything yet that we've been hearing about so there's still kind of some hang up in that situation but there are for classes that aren't like drawing that are like sculpture or uh, ceramics or printmaking they have actually gone to like a block schedule to where um, an A, B, and a, a, a day and a B day will happen, and then the students will show up on those days and have their one work day a week, and then they have like at home kind of work that they mm -hmm. have to kind of back up as well. Yeah. So it's kind of like blended, but at the same time, it's still kind of very like hands off and uh, very much kind mm -hmm. of in the nature of higher art education, which for me was a lot of uh, self discovery, and that's kind of what I'm kind of imparting onto my students right now. Mm -hmm. 
I wonder if this situation will um, make, I, I mean, I don't know if this is as much for like secondary education, um, but I know with higher ed, material budgets does end up being a really big part of um, the friction that teachers might find with having students of, of you know, different levels of um, of economic classes and what and what you can afford. So um, hopefully that will be a kind of a part of the silver lining of this is there, there'll be a better understanding that art is made out of things, right? Um, and a pencil and a paper is a really great place to be. But, um, you know, like for me teaching printmaking, stuff like tape really starts to add up for students. Um, so that's great to know that that's kind of a, a part of what everyone is focusing on right now. Um, and if, within that, my next question for everybody is just sort of like, what is working? Like, I know that this is really early in the year and that last spring was uh, pretty chaotic for everyone. Um, but what have you found that is working for you um, or for, for your students um, with the formats that you've been playing around with? Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, I think for me, like... Um, hey, Desiree, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Can you speak up a bit? It's because I was far away. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Come on in here. A little bit closer? Okay. <laughs> is that a little bit better? It is, yeah. Thank okay. you. All right, um, I guess for me what's been working is um, giving my students more time um, and being okay with explaining multiple, multiple things multiple times, like understanding and communication in that way. Um, because I find that like the same small creative projects that I would do at the beginning of the school year still works perfectly fine while they're at home, as long as I'm willing to like step back and be like, okay, well this project typically takes three days to finish, let me just give them the whole week. And um, realizing that, that it just needs to be in baby steps. Um, so really also breaking down more projects um, to be smaller steps. So like we work on these three steps for this week and then we work on the next three steps next week. So just to kind of help them keep track of things and for me to keep track of things, um, I find that to be working really well right now. Yeah, I think that, um on a universal level, there's something there too, that like everyone kind of had to slow things down for a minute and it kind of recontextualized like how much we try to fit in um, all the time. So more time for your students to complete projects. Yeah. Cool. Um, what about the rest yeah, of the I, think, I think for me, it's been like the kind of being okay with the this kind of moving to an asynchronous kind of function, letting the students kind of let my, the work that I'm giving them fit into their schedules. And so everything, yeah, the idea of time, giving them more time on some pro like on, on more hands-on projects too, is, I found is really helpful. And they're more willing to communicate with me problems that they're having with the projects because they have that time. Mm. Um, I, have, I have run up against some people who like, they could have posed a question to me way earlier in the period than waiting till, you know, two hours before my deadline. But I think there's a, to me, that's, it's happened so little that it's almost not even, like I shouldn't have probably mentioned it, but I think that there is still that outlier, that there are people that are still going to kind of take advantage of, or try to take advantage of this idea that we are so remote. But because of how, like, the, fun, the how the programs that we work with work is that, um, things like Blackboard, for instance, I can see like how often they've looked at it. I can see like when they've downloaded certain things, I can see how long ago it was since they've looked at something. So, and I, and I honestly think like every one of my students is participating more than they would inside a classroom in some instances. So there is this that they, I'm getting more opinions from people about the works of art. I'm getting more um, questions just in general because people feel more comfortable. They can come to me with a private question. It's more private one-on-one -on -one than it is like this lecture hall, essentially, not really a lecture hall, but classroom setting, which can still be intimidating. I mean, to sit there and try to put your thoughts out in front of a whole bunch of people who you don't really know that well because you're not in class with them all the time. And except for like, there's two or yeah, one hour and a half that we are. 
efforts would be for two times a week. And then we can get more nuanced in that individual conversation too. So it gets more um, um, uh, specialized towards what the students' questions are. And so, especially at like me, when I have like, it's a little bit more hands off, like I get to kind of, as long as I'm kind of checking the boxes of what the district wants, I can kind of, I have control of like how that information comes out and what we look at and how the students kind of interact with it and how I can kind of tweak it for each individual student. I can't normally do that when we're lecturing in person or when I'm doing something in person either. It's just been kind of interesting. Does it take you more time? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, but that's cool. Yeah, it kind of lets different, um, a different type of students. And, you know, I think especially when you get into college age, so many art students are kind of more of an introvert type. Um, interesting. What, what about you, Jesse? What is working for your students? So we switched to using Google Class. Um, in my classroom, we added that last year a little bit. Um, I teach a lot of students with varied abilities and then also students who are deaf. And so it helps so much, um, just like Brantley was saying, like with getting student feedback and comments, even before like COVID and probably after COVID, I'll still utilize online answering forms because students will students have like a freer sense because they're not having to directly share something. So that's really helpful. Um, and then also just, I mean, things that are going well, breaking things down into really small pieces. And I mean, the students that I had today in class, they were able to finish it in 30 minutes and it's like an 80 minute block. And so I'm struggling to get some students at home to do 30 minutes worth of work. But when they show up to class, you know, they have some more time. I mean, it's, it's working to get more kids to turn things in, but I'm questioning this week, like, is it worth slowing down, like everything in the curriculum, like compressing it and mm -hmm. moving things around? And... Yeah. Have you guys heard of uh, like the concept of flipping the classroom? Um, I know what a flipped classroom is, but I'm not sure if it's the same as what you're... I'm also like pulling something that I knew about years ago, um, so I might butcher it, but the idea is that instead of like the teacher lecturing in the classroom, the student should listen to a lecture at home for homework and then do the work mm. in the classroom where this, the teacher can like interact differently and it, they're able to be more hands-on so that you're not using your your classroom time as the period of time in which you are just giving information um and i apologize for having a really uninformed version of what i just explained but y'all just made me think of it um I've, my uncle um, is in education. I remember him telling me about this a while back. So that, that might be something that's kind of interesting to look into um, mm -hmm. because this is like years ago that this concept came out and school started experimenting with it. And it seems a little bit like what everyone is sort of being forced into um, trying out anyway, based on what y'all are saying. Um, what about resources? I know that uh, different school districts have sort of struggled to get different teaching resources out to students, but I know that our education as it's like, it's not a part of the standardized testing and it kind of becomes an outlier. Um, so, you know, and, and, and also because creative people tend to be teachers, they might, gravitate towards finding their own resources anyway versus taking what might be offered to them by their by their district but what have you found like what are, what have been your go-to resources for your either giving to your students or for you absorbing as a teacher so i'm a resource hound i'll start this off because i search out and search for places that i know will help um, typically in an art year we receive we actually do receive 
um, funds from our district because we are a state tested course. Um, and so it's our state scores that help like us receive money and that's why they rationalize that our classes need funds so that way we can properly like do art. Um, so it's kind of strange because I'm, I'm still curious this year if we'll have state testing because if students can't come to school if they do it digital like are my scores going to be great <laughs> because the kids can just look up answers on their computer, you know? Um, but I, um, we were told we were getting no funds this year. And so I resourced and did a donor's choose. Thanks to Desiree. Desiree does a lot of donor's choose, um, even though we do get funding. Because the funding that we do get is so minimal that, I mean, it's enough for shared markers, shared colored pencils, small project paper. Um, it's really, really bare bones. And I was told I'd be getting some money last week. I think last week I was told we, we would get some money, but I will believe it. <laughs> I will believe it when it happens. So, um, but then also there's other groups and organizations, especially here in Dallas. So I don't know if the Women's Junior League is doing their typical thing, but they normally have a great resource for educators um, where you can ask, um, you can write a grant through them. Um, and then there's several organizations I try to partner with. Um, but this year with COVID, it's been a little funky. Um, and then Instagram teachers online, they are wonderful resources. They are so, so wonderful because everyone, everyone teaches so differently, even in the studio. I mean, if you have 50 printmakers, you're going to have 50 different ways to etch a stone. I mean, there's so many different methods. And so using them as resources to kind of pick and choose and pull from has just been great because it can, you can find things that you can alter or make work for you. Um, when speaking of resources, something that I'd like to do after this conversation, and I don't really know where this will live. It'll probably be like on a Facebook page and maybe eventually on our website. Um, I'd love to kind of compile and have a little bit of like an open source sharing of different resources that um, people are finding useful um, as using that as like a part of the silver lining of the situation is that um, maybe by everyone having to put themselves in a new situation, we're finding new solutions as well. Um, so listeners, <laughs> present or future, um, I'd love to get some information from you, Jesse, and, and you, Desiree, about how you've gone about that, those funding methods as well. W what was the name you called it? Um, I think you're on mute, Desiree, maybe. Um, donors Choose is the first one. And Donors Choose is great because they work with a lot of international or like they work with a lot of national foundations, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they'll do like partner shares. So that's a really great one. Uh, the Women's Junior League of Dallas, and even if you're someone who's looking to invest in an organization, um, the donors, uh, the, the Women's League, they do such great things. Um, I know there are a lot of people who want to and like volunteering with kids, um, especially like after school for reading programs or different things like that. And work, if you like partner with someone who's already doing something successful, you can sometimes have a greater impact, I think, on a teaching community than volunteering one day, um, once a month, you know what I mean? Not to say that that's bad because that's also very beneficial. Yeah, awesome, thanks, uh, I wrote this down. Um, I also just want to interject real quick. Uh, Michonne Landry just commented on the Flip Classroom with a, a link about, uh, about more about that and said, a Flip cl Classroom is a type of blended learning where students are introduced to content at home and practice working through it at school. This is a reverse of the more common practice of introducing new content at school than assigning homework and projects to be completed by the students independently at home. I know that art already kind of operates a little bit more in the latter anyway, um, but you know, still something to consider. Um, what about uh, Brantley and Desiree? What resources have been clutched for you these days? I guess for me, it's been definitely donors choose. Like I have a donors choose up like every, every time I get a chance just because I want my students to have a well-rounded experience with art. And I see so many kids um, 
so that's been great when it comes to like funding for supplies, um, basic art supplies. Um, but then also like I use, I used to like look for websites that gave me like lesson ideas and whatnot. But Instagram teachers, like if you just type in like hashtag art teacher or hashtag like middle school art teacher, you'll get so many different, you'll get so many lesson ideas, information, um, pictures to go along with it. So that way you can kind of get a well-rounded idea of what you could be doing. Um, I know that that was extremely helpful when it came to like teaching IB art because at the time I was only middle school. And then we added another middle school. So I was using Instagram and essentially like Twitter, um, looking for more international schools that were doing IB. And that's kind of what helped me make like a, a middle school program that's, that is able to thrive with IB, even though we don't have the same scheduling as everybody else. Because mm -hmm. it's vastly different. Yeah. International baccalaureate for anyone who doesn't. Sorry know. about that. I can no, it's good. <laughs> so when you guys say Instagram teachers online, like that's not an account. You mean you you just Instagram teachers online? Okay, just making sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there's professors. So my background is teaching um, lower level and then higher ed as well. And there's higher ed teachers that are beginning to post more. And there's a few that are like posting like that have been doing digital for a long time now. And so it's nice to kind of go back through their sites also. And that's the beauty of Instagram, right? You can just scroll through someone who's been doing this for the past five years to really see what works well and then what is kind of a flop. Yeah. Um, there's one, I'll, well, um, let me ask, have Brantley answer and then I'll get back to one I've found. Brantley, what are you oh. been using? Um, so for me, it's, it's making sure students have access to the information and I come, I, they do have access to their textbooks that they're required to get, but I find some of that stuff and some of the art in there quite limiting. So I have the art and movements and materials and stuff that I like to kind of go through as well. And I make sure that they have access to those things. Uh, by, you know, referencing my old textbooks, referencing my old notes, referencing um, museum websites, um, current articles, like I just sent them an article about the, the Philip, <laughs> the Philip Gustin thing that's going on. Yeah. Um, so having current events and seeing these kinds of things cycle back through and making sure that they have access to those articles. And then also like PDFs from scholars, critics and art, like um, and art historians that um, you kind of have to know where to go find that stuff and then making sure they have access to it. So they're not just getting like a textbook kind of sterile information about it, but they're getting someone's kind of nuanced approach and look to it. And so like I find myself going back through some of my old, just like old books about like certain paintings, certain movements and paintings and, and, and photocopying them and getting digital copies of them and making sure that students can kind of have access to them. And now when we have to worry about accessibility, when, when if, they, if they put it through like a reader or something and it has to be able to read everything correctly. So now it's taking those, the scanned PDF documents and kind of converting them into more or less like a, a Word document that can be read has, has been very, that's been kind of challenging to get all that kind of happening. But that's been happening since before COVID. So I've already kind of been going through that and logging all of the PDFs and stuff. But those things have been that kind of my own resources that I've been compiling for years has just been really helpful, especially when I'm trying to model myself after lecturing and looking at my old teachers and contacting them and them telling me the same thing. <laughs> it's like we just reference who we you know, like who we learn from. And mm -hmm. so that's just that, as far as resources go. These are the things you guys have been talking about are new things to me. That's great. I'm going to kind of totally check them out and see what's up. Um, see if there's any way that they can kind of play into helping students get resources. Because I do find that students are in money crunches, especially when it comes to getting things like little supplies for art appreciation. Um, drawing, they know they're about to drop at least $150 on supplies. Yeah. But in art appreciation, there's always, it always seems to, students are surprised at how expensive just buying, you know, like a set of pencils and a notebook is. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I'm really excited to check out some of these resources so I can maybe myself try to grab some things and maybe point students in certain directions too, because colleges more, it's more there, they have to kind of pursue it. And 
So, yeah. Yeah, there's a little bit less structure. Um, and, and like also on that note um, is the whole textbook thing, which like I know um, you don't have, I'm sure you don't have textbooks for your elementary school students, right? Or do you? Technically, yes. Technically, we yeah. Do. So the textbooks are all digital and our school has paid for access for students. Um, but I, I mean, I, this probably stems from like teaching higher ed and knowing students are less likely to buy a textbook. I try to make my lectures as inclusive as possible to what needs to be said and what's pertinent. Yeah. And then if they are reading or looking at things, it's from outside resources, like using interesting articles or things that you've just compiled. I mean, random essays and such. So when um, I was teaching at community college, we were actually not allowed to tell the students that they didn't really need the textbook because like it would put the college in a financial bind if no one bought the textbook. But then there was the issue of the textbook being just as expensive as the class. And with so many resources, I, just, I see you smirking. I know it's terrible, um, but it, it, it's, you know, Again, these are the, some of the things that I'm hoping virtual education will maybe um, upend a little bit that, um, that we need to rethink some of these requirements. Well, and I'd be curious to know if libraries offer digital copies of the textbooks, because I know I would encourage my students to go to the library and utilize the library resources. Um, Cause I know, I don't know. I just wonder like if there's a dig if there isn't like a digital resource or I'd encourage them to be friends on Remind or something like or on WeChat or whatever. Mm -hmm. I really love um, Khan Academy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Khan Academy. Um, they have a lot of good video content and, and they do great summaries um, in terms of art history uh, and also uh, art story. Art story is a really good one too. Um, so those are two art history ones I like a lot. Um, and something that I follow on Instagram now that I think is interesting is an account that's called um, what do we do now dot art. Um, and it is a project share for higher ed. Um, and it's all it, it started. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it started in the pandemic. Um, and it, it's sort of like a call for teachers to um, you know, if they have a good project to put it there for other people to see. Uh, we have a comment here. Um, I'm just curious how the digital divide is impacting students on each of their respective schools. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think art is often seen as kind of one of the social places that um, not to interrupt you, Adrian, you might want to give people a preface before going to that site right now. The um objects on it are a little bit graphic and adult in content okay well their instagram isn't <laughs> good to know um thank you jesse um okay wait two questions sorry i'm falling behind on my q a management um if the schools are in virtual okay michonne i'm sorry did we answer that question for you already i think maybe we did um so we have basically Desiree and Jesse are moving to hybrid next week. Um, and uh, Brantley has been uh, virtual all along. Um, but yeah, getting back to, oh yeah. So how do you feel like this is impacting how your students are um, handling art? I know actually some of you guys had when we talked earlier some surprising outcomes of like whether your students are doing better or worse are they getting the same kind of um creative outlet that you think that they might have or can you tell at all i know my lower level students are not doing as well like my introductory students um they are so scared and they're so timid to do things. So I know if they were in a classroom watching other people fail with them, they might feel better about it and they might have more success in that way. My advanced students enjoy art and they like being there and they like making. And so um, 
they're making more and I'm trying to, with all of my advanced students, I have a slideshow I share each week with, a, I call it good stuff, great job. And it's in like all caps. And if you get featured on good stuff, great job, it's like, oh, oh, they're doing that. Like, okay, well, I can do, I can do something better than that. And so um, utilizing that as a place for them to like see and be inspired. And then um, for them, which I might try it with my lower level and see if it sparks anything. Um, but for them, I use Padlet, which is like a really super easy way to do art critiques because people can post, um, you can post anything really. I used it at a teacher conference where everyone posted um, like different ideas or resources that they use. And it's kind of like a homemade DIY Pinterest that you can comment on. So it's pretty neat in that way. Padlet, like P-A-D-L-E-T? Yeah. And you can get like, like I use the free version and you can get three or four free at a time. And then, um, yeah. And then, and then you can just archive them when they get old, but it's such a great way. Um, and you can upvote and downvote items. So if you agree or disagree with someone's comment, if it's like, you know, if you're doing it about a, a work of art and you want to get students opinions, um, it's a great thing for that as well. Um, uh, Mishan just clarified digital divide a little better. Thank you, Mishan. Um, what she means is the um, growing gap between underprivileged members of society, especially the poor, rural, elderly, and handicapped portion of the population who do not have access to computers or the internet, um, and the wealthy middle class and young Americans living in the urban and suburban. Um, you know, this would be a great question. Like when I was at a community college, we were in a rural area, but uh, so, but you know, even in Dallas, there's some major internet lags um, in parts of the city, but because of the way DISD is structured in neighborhoods, do you see that? Do you have any kids struggling with access to internet? Yeah, it's most of our population at this point. Actually. Sorry, what Desiree? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's most of our population. Our, it's for me, um, I want to say it's probably 50% of our school. 50? Wow. Because yeah. where we sit is a very interesting place. Um, it's like we get, we're in between, literally between East Dallas and South Dallas. So our feeder pattern gets a good amount of kids. And you start to, it's not really something that you think about. Um, as a teacher that the student might not have internet service when they get home or they might not have this or that. They have a cell phone, so they can obviously get on the internet. Um, but it's become vastly, it's become very apparent, apparent, like the first week of school, logging in, and I, I have the big, I have big classes. I just have big classes, but I go from having a class of 30 students to only seeing 10 of them. And um, it's been a, like, that's one reason why I'm taking it slow, because I can't hold that against them. Um, but then also when they come back, like some of these kids just have to come back. There's no other option for them. Like DISD is doing what they can by giving them the hotspots and trying. Um, but at the end of the day, they're still not reaching every student. You know, I'm still, I mean, we're in week four, right? So at week four, my class of 30 students, I'm still missing five now. So um, I'm excited for them to come back because it's just like that for some odd reason, we just can't close that gap. Like not for some odd reason, well, lack of funds at some point, yeah. we can't close that. We can't close the gap. We, um, we can try to give them a hot spot, but if the area doesn't have like a good cellular tower, they're not gonna get great internet service. You know, we're asking them to run Zoom or Google Meets and then all this other stuff on their computer. And we already know that it lags. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily going to be sustainable. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, it's good that we're giving them that option to come back to school because at this point there's, um, it's not necessarily working to the best benefit for the child. Yeah, that's where I think of like Brantley, um, Zoom really does use like it, it crushes your data usage. Um, I try to use it with a hotspot for a while when I had bad internet myself. Um, and you're uploading and downloading video simultaneously. Um, do you is that something Brantley that like with your 
synchronous classroom that you think is working well? Yeah, that's why that's one of the main reasons why I decided to go to an asynchronous function was that I, I have like a good chunk of my students that have to go somewhere to access the internet so they can download the things they need to download. And when they go home, they have to make sure they have everything that they need. And it will be hours before they can get back to me because they have no internet service and they don't have like the data plan or whatever to be able to sit there and just blow data on these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And their phones can't handle it anyways. Like, the, I mean, they're powerful, but they're not, they're not computers. And to try to like navigate, I mean, navigating on a phone is a lot, to me, is a lot harder than navigating on my computer, especially when we're in a thing like Blackboard or doing one or Zoom even. I mean, I don't know. I kind of like Zoom better on my phone than I do on my computer, but that's a whole different thing. But so there is, there's, there, I, I've been finding that, yeah, the asynchronous is definitely helping, but it, it, there's still some like I still have I still have concerns because I I, I my my numbers aren't as staggering as Desiree's that's insane like but like mine are mine are still like I have I we're week five going five now and I have still per class I have like I have five classes and in each class I have anywhere between two and seven students that I haven't contacted had contact with at all mm -hmm. and I've contacted the school and they've they've said they've even had trouble getting in touch with them. So there, I think it has something to do with this, this, this digital divide that we're all experiencing or that's been highlighted because it's already been there. It's, it's just being highlighted because of this problem, because of COVID. You know, phones are, I think, like seen as sort of this like personal thing to, to have access to someone's phone number. But um, one uh, former um, Cedars Union artist, Joel Murray, I was talking to him. He, he is... Uh, he teaches at Richland or now Dallas College, and he started picking up the phone a lot more and just calling his students um, so that he can actually, like, you know, it's, it's just a little bit less internet heavy. It still requires the privilege of a phone bill. Um, well, and sometimes and, it requires the privilege of, you know, habla espanol. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. That's a good point. I have 60 kids on my list to call, and so far, half a dozen that I've called out of the 12, like half of what I've called have all been Spanish speaking. Yeah. Well, and you don't have the same kind of visual cues as you would in a classroom for someone who is learning a new language. That's a good point too. So we were thinking that we were going to focus so much on solutions, but the, like in the end, there's just a lot. But these aren't these aren't things that are new to virtual classroom, you know. Well, no, I mean, honestly, sometimes in groups like this, when you do highlight a few things that are a common issue, it might percolate like an idea or like system of helping that you wouldn't think of on your own. So I'm not totally opposed to what's not working because sometimes if it's not working for me, that doesn't mean that it's not working for someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then also like talking about the digital divide, or sorry, talking about the digital divide as a whole, it's like, you know, yeah, it's not, it's a problem, but I feel like the solution at this moment is us going hybrid and getting those kids into our classroom and holding the discussion with them and really kind of, for us, like, like kind of giving them the idea of holding them accountable, but then also like, I see a solution and maybe like, if we end up going back home, like more or less leaving everything asynchronous for my students and be like, you can still come you come to the dish, the school and log in with your district email on your computer and sit outside, download everything and then go back home. Mm -hmm. So it's like right there, I see a solution for a lot of my students, especially mm -hmm. if like they decide to stay home, but they still don't have the internet service, maybe leading everything to be more asynchronous for them. So that way they're still able to be successful. And I mean, honestly, that's where I think more equity would come in to play because those are the students who need to be in the building, not, not like the kids who can work well from home. Um, I know it's really important to have mental check-ins also. And I think that is like something that should not be neglected, but it's difficult because we have, we can only allow so many people in the building due to like social distancing. So I'm, I'll be curious to see if that is successful in play next week. Yeah. Well, we have 10 more minutes. Um, one thing that I would love to know 
uh, is how institutions, um, how institutions can support art teachers right now. Um, I know just being from like museum and nonprofit background is something we think about a lot. Um, and there are teams of people that are looking for ways to help. I mean, you know, it, it, or even as like a group of teachers, is there anything that you feel like communally would be helpful for your students or, or for having students be able to access art in, in this situation? Uh, yeah, one resource, that, I'm sorry, one resource that has been like uh, really cool is um, the virtual exhibit for the BMA, um, I forget what it's called, but House for Dreamers or Dream or Dreamer Dreamers. Dreamer of Houses, yeah. Yeah, that, that exhibition. I showed that to my students um, as just like a way to like see that you can see art at home still and that they love that. They like to like just scroll through. I think Cause also did one for um, a museum that he was at and I showed them that one too. And so they mm -hmm. got to tour it virtually. Um, so having more resources like that to see those different types of things is really great because we can't take field trips. Um, but then also the students that I typically wouldn't take on field trips get to have this opportunity to see this work too. Um, cause a lot of them, some of them can't, you know, they can't leave the house or they can't go to the museum by themselves or they don't have money to afford the ticketed places. Um, but then also like having, I guess more curriculum ideas from them too. Cause I feel like that was one thing that a lot of teachers have struggled with was coming up with new lessons and ideas because basically their old way was thrown out the window. If you hadn't been adapting or changing what you've been doing, um, over the years and you've been doing the constant same thing based out of a textbook, you're just like in the wind in a sense. Mm -hmm. So it's like having um, more resources on what can be taught in the classroom or what can be taught virtually, but then also like having an idea and a breakdown of supply wise that's more um, feasible. Um, that's like within, I guess, 10 to $12 per student. So those things would be, um, greatly beneficial if our institutions can provide that. Cool. Yeah, I would say more access to stuff. <laughs> they just need, they, we need to have more access to materials. We need to have, we actually, especially for students that, especially studio students that are still having trouble getting into the studios. Um, I know that like UNT and a couple of the bigger actual four-year colleges are getting to go into their studios and use their spaces and I think that if they can figure it out that these institutions that other Dallas College can definitely figure it out and some and if and if they already are figuring out for students who need to have access to the like for like printmaking and uh, um, sculpture and um, ceramics equipment and that would also kind of stop this um, this kind of like there's this, almost this wall that some of my drawing students they said that they were feeling and during during some of the the idea of interaction the idea of a, a the professor watching them draw or something it's, it's an interesting piece of feedback that I got from a couple of my drawing students that they missed that kind of relationship there and then but you know I <laughs> As far as like support and stuff goes, it's just you know, making sure that we can still have, making sure everyone still has access to whatever they need access to so we can all succeed, so we can all learn what we need to kind of learn and then so we can present the materials that we need to present and present them in a, pre a presentable manner, like a, a, a yeah. digestible yeah. manner. And so, yeah, and just kind of keeping, you know, I. I would honestly like to see more resources from them, like versus just like, here's this textbook, this is what your students are gonna be getting and more kind of alternative ways of viewing things, uh, different ways of kind of going about um, learning certain things. I don't know, more lays off air. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, just, I was gonna say, are any of you guys planning on publishing any of your projects or like making those available to other teachers? That's such a hard. Do you want more work right now? <laughs> I 
think that's kind of what teachers are running into, but that's why I kind of ask. I know that program and education departments at museums are like running in circles trying to find ways to bring arts to people and yeah, online curriculum. Um, I mean, on one hand, I firmly, okay, so example, I received a packet from a printmaker and it was before I went to Frogman's and it was like, here's Michael Barnes, how to etch a stone. And it was, um, you know, his handout on it. It's how he does it, like all the notes, just like any lesson we would create. And there is no way that packet could recreate the experience I had of him teaching me how to etch and how to like create a lithograph. So in my opinion, like I can give you my handout and I can tell you what's going on, but I mean the same thing, Martha Stewart can give me her cake recipe. It is not mean that my cake is going to turn out the same. Like something is going to be different and those little nuances, um, you can't, I mean, so part of me is like, yeah, I can share a lesson. I can't guarantee you're going to get the same results because we're going to notice and we're going to do different things. Um, and uh, even I've, even students have had, I've had, I've noticed that the way even I phrase things when I, in my assignment sheets, when I'm handing some stuff out, I try to, I read it over and over and over again. I give it to a couple of other people to read over to make sure it's clear and concise. And then I still get people very confused about what do you mean by like, just draw this subject or what do you mean by do these certain things and so it, yeah yeah I've I've switched okay so this is gonna sound real silly there's on Google Drive uh, through the Google network uh, you can create a document and there's one called a pet resume it has a really cute dog and it's called pet resume it's one of their templates and that pet resume is what I use for all of my assignments and if my assignment I mean, it's like, this is what you're doing. This is how, this is what I'm expecting from you. Um, and then you need to come to Zoom. So that way I can break down and I can tell you what's going on. Because if I try to write that down, like, forget it, forget it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I, I think I keep going back to like the baking idea and the, and the cooking concept, you know, they're not going to tell you how to flip the pan and how to hold your wrist, but I can break it down and show you in a live demo, um, and we can check back in at the end of Zoom, but it's that kind of nuanced little thing that's going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. um, I just dropped a link about the concept of multiple intelligences um, in the chat box as like an example of something that might be interesting to read about and like how, I know earlier, Brantley, you were talking about how some students were actually doing better for you because they maybe have anxiety about showing up to class and online learning has removed that anxiety for them and they're actually participating more. Um, but then there might be like the students that are like maybe more like me that like <laughs> thrive on social interaction and, and have trouble learning from a screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think like learning what different multiple intelligences are and trying to create curriculum that um, maybe meets all these different needs. And then also want to add that like, oh, we have more questions. Do we? No, we don't. Um, add with the fact that this, uh, maybe this is a lot more work for you guys as teachers right now to refigure all this stuff out and to, to give yourself some grace on, um, you know, not not having to be perfect about it because it's, it's an imperfect. What, what an interesting experience for everybody to have to relearn everything and, and reformat their teaching all at once. You know, it's a good thing to just look at it like whatever you're reformatting it as, like it's going to benefit you in the long run. And so, you know, I have to, that's what I have to keep saying to myself as I like learn new things to do, like the basic thing of taking attendance and having to really um, dive into somebody who paid attention during tech apps class in high school and college, um, who made amazing forms and sheets and like really diving into how to use those in order for me to take better attendance. But then like, now that I've learned that, I'm gonna keep using it. So that's how I've been looking at it. And that's why it's like, 
at the end of the day, I don't feel like, oh, this is for nothing. Like, oh, I'm going to be able to use this whenever we have this type of situation. Or if we go hybrid, it's going to be a lot easier for me to keep track of my kids that are in school and then my kids are at home instead of like trying to do attendance and messing up my life because attendance is hard. I might have told you that. <laughs> attendance is hard. <laughs> Um, but then also like, just like Padlet and Flipboard and all these other, um, apps that we have to learn. I still see myself using it after all this is over because one thing that I, and my kids have said this too, they miss interaction. They miss like being able to see somebody else's artwork and being like, mm -hmm. oh, I can't do that. But then deep down inside, they're like, yes, I can't. So I'm going to try. So it's like to be able to have those programs now, it's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, we're going to just start using this. So that way kids who are at, virtually at home don't feel left out of the conversation. So I'm kind of excited about that. Thank you. Awesome. Well, all of, I've been taking notes. I'm going to add these maybe on like an Instagram story resource tab. Um, but uh, thank you, everybody, for um, sharing what you've learned and um, for kind of staying on top of things. And <laughs> everyone's shaking their head. No, uh, I think it's it's really really inspiring to hear from your flexibility. So um, if anyone hasn't told you, good job yet. Good job. What's what's your board called, Jesse? Good job, great stuff. Good job, great stuff. Awesome. Okay, well, have a good evening and we'll see you later. Thanks. Bye.